Here's Todd Friel to give seven goofy arguments for a biblical flood. This is Wretched Radio with Todd Friel. Speaking of the ark, this is Wretched Radio. Answers in Genesis. Currently, uh, thousands of people walking through a recreation of Noah's ark. It is a magnificent museum because that's what it is. It's, It's not like some sort of theme park. It's a museum, tons of teaching. Todd has to say that to try to justify the Ark Museum's draconian rule that forbids people from riding the plastic triceratops. Please go with your family and then get up to the Creation Museum a little further north. Spend a day at each and you will be more edified and you will be more secure in your knowledge. Uh, Genesis has a lot of answers. Ironically, the Creation Museum up north will let you ride the triceratops. And that's pretty catchy. Genesis has a lot of answers. We could work with that. So the other night, I'm reading Answers Magazine. This is a great magazine to get for you and your family, especially if you are at all interested in science stuff at all. And even if you're not, a knucklehead like me can actually read this and get this stuff. The headline on or the cover on this particular issue The seven best evidences of the global flood. You know you're dealing with a creationist when you hear the word evidences. This will ring in your ears. You are going to love this. You're going to go, yes, yes, that's right. My Bible is true. Somebody who doesn't believe in God will not receive this information. How can that be? That's what's called confirmation bias. How can two people in the same room hearing the same evidence come up with such radically different conclusions not everybody has the same level of critical thinking skills that is the moral to this seven point story you and i love this because we believe it the world who does not believe they cannot receive it so then what's the point of presenting it it's staggering to me. It's just its just amazing to me. When you hear a scientific scoffer say, well, the world being covered in water, that's ridiculous. Have they never flown to Europe or the Middle East or to Asia? Look down from your window. If, if, if you've got a window seat and they don't make you close the window and wear a mask over your head, the point is there's a lot of water on the planet. Yeah, there's a lot of water on the planet, but there's also a lot of land that the oceans clearly fail to cover. If there's enough water on the planet to cover all of the land, then why doesn't it cover all of the land all of the time? Three quarters of the earth is already covered. It wouldn't be that much more difficult for God to take care of the other quarter. Well, if your explanation is God did it, then the amount of water on the planet is quite irrelevant. It wouldn't be that difficult for an all-powerful being to cover any planet in water. It wouldn't matter how much is already there. And yet they deny it. Why? Because you haven't demonstrated that a God exists in the first place. To the evidence we go, courtesy of Answers Magazine. Number one, marine fossils high on mountains. Did you know that? There are marine fossils. They should be in the water way down below, and yet they're on top of the mountains. A lot of places that are on mountaintops now were once not on mountaintops. A lot of those places were at the bottom of an ocean or sea long ago. Mountains haven't existed since the beginning of the planet. There are fish fossils in the Himalayas, for example, because that mountain range formed when what is now India was an island that collided with mainland Asia. The rock layers that were lifted into the air by this continental collision have fish fossils because they were once at the bottom of what geologists call the Tethys Sea. Go figure from the magazine, fossils are one of the best evidences of a global flood, especially where many fossils are found. Example, we don't find marine creatures such as fish, clams, and corals buried and fossilized on the seafloor where they once lived. That's not true. In fact, one of the clues that show that climate change is happening is the differences we see over time in exactly those kinds of fossils that can be found on the seafloor. Instead, we find most of them buried in a sedimentary rocks on the continents, even on high mountains. For that to happen, the ocean waters had to totally flood the continents, and I would even suggest recede somewhat rapidly, and that's exactly what the Bible describes. Why would a sediment layer need to recede rapidly? Wouldn't that wash away a lot of the freshly laid and thus still loose layer of sediment? We find ammonite fossils, squids, 
with shells in limestone layers high up on the Himalayas in Nepal, near the top of Mount Everest. Maybe, maybe somebody brought him up there. I know, Ken Ham, he went up the mountain and he just put him there so that you got that evidence. It's all a scam, what it is. Or maybe continental drift is a thing. Why don't you look up what the actual scientific explanation is instead of consulting the caricature of an atheist you have in your mind? We find marine fossils in most rock layers exposed in the Grand Canyon walls in Arizona. If the fossils were laid down in one single flood that quickly receded, why would the fossils be in most rock layers instead of just one? Number two evidence of a global flood, massive fossil graveyards around the world. Gee, it's almost like things living all around the world also die all around the world. And it's like you can find places all around the world that are especially prone to fossil formation. Number three, exquisitely preserved fossils. Some squids with fossili are, were fossilized with ink still in their ink sacs. You're going to have to unpack this for me. Why is that evidence of a flood? If a squid dies under normal circumstances, does their ink leak out before they fossilize? Why would that happen? How would a flood cause something to fossilize more quickly? And in a classic example of rapid burial, and it's a... And Ichthyosaur, a marine reptile apparently, about six feet long, was fossilized at the moment it was giving birth. How does that happen? It doesn't. It wasn't fossilized the moment it was giving birth. It just died at the moment it was giving birth. The fossilization process still would have taken years. Why would a flood be needed to explain that something died suddenly and then got buried by sediment? Why can't that happen without a flood? Boom! Something caught it and overwhelmed it and fossilized it. A flood did that. And global floods are apparently the only thing that can do this for some reason. Only the catastrophic global flood could rapidly bury so many large creatures in layers that are so extensive. What makes you think these things were rapidly buried? If they are found in a sedimentary layer, we know that they were buried, but how can you tell they were rapidly buried? And if they were rapidly buried, why couldn't something like a seafloor landslide cause this? Number four, sediment spread around the continents, covering vast areas, every continent. Sedimentary rocks laid down by the catastrophic flood conditions. Many of these sediment layers can be traced all the way across the continents and even between continents. What is the scientific explanation for that? Continental drift. Separate continents that share fossil layers were once joined together. Continents that are dry now were once on an ocean floor. From an evolutionary standpoint, which of course denies, well, pretty much everything in Genesis and everywhere else. This is proof that God flooded the world as he said in the Bible. How is it proof when it's not even the most probable explanation? Number five, features of the sedimentary labor layers. Which features specifically? Number six, no sign of millions of years between the layers. What would you take to be a sign of millions of years? Some fossil layers have totally different sets of organisms than other layers. This is evidence of millions of years of biological and ecological change from one layer to another. Why would a sudden global flood deposit different sets of animals in different layers? There should be, but there aren't. At the boundaries between some sedimentary layers, we find evidence of only rapid erosion. In most other cases, the boundaries are flat, and featureless with absolutely no evidence of erosion, which is consistent with no long periods of elapsed time during the global flood ca cataclysm. But if the flood were global, wouldn't you find one global layer with only rapid erosion? We see plenty of erosion features like riverbeds cutting between layers. Here's a presentation by Corporal Anon about erosion between fossil layers. Well, you often hear this claim that there's no erosion between the strata, um, but this just isn't true. Uh, you find erosional surfaces like buried river valleys, canyons, uh, river channels, hills, mesas, and other things are indeed present. For example, right here, this is an actual buried landscape that is found in Eocene sediment off the coast of Iceland. This was a cataclysmic event. Boom, big, in so many ways. In the outpouring of water and the receding of the water, that changed the planet, and it explains why we have sedimentary layers, why we have fossil graveyards, and why we've got fossils way up on the hills. 
But gradual fossilization and continental drift explain it without problems like why we don't see a genetic bottleneck, or why there seems to be no archaeological evidence of cultural extinction in different human populations. When Noah's descendants got to China, did they look at all the Chinese cultural artifacts and decide to abandon their own culture and just pick up Chinese culture where it left off? There seems to be no evidence of simultaneous global cultural disruption at the time the flood is supposed to have taken place. All proof that the Bible is true. Number seven, evidence in the folds. Further evidence that these layers were laid down quickly, not over millions of years, are the folds we find in these sediment layers. By the folds, I assume he means rock layer folds that are caused by geological pressure. You can tell they are caused by geological pressure from the stress fractures in them that creationists like to try to trick you into thinking aren't there. These folds were the product of cemented rock layers buckling under pressure, not sediment layers being gently folded. Another argument that I really liked was this claim that you see these big folds that don't have any fractures in them. And again, this one just isn't true. What I've got here is an example of a big fold in the Tapete sandstone. Andrew Snelling loves this one. This right here is actually a picture taken by Andrew Snelling, and this is a picture of the same fold taken by the USGS Geological Survey. If we zoom in, you notice how blurry his is and how clear the USGS one was? You can see several blatant stress fractures running through this rock. In Snelling's, he puts someone in front of one of these big fractures. Why? If these cracks aren't stress fractures and they don't debunk his argument, why didn't he just take a picture of them and address them? Answers Magazine, the seven best evidences of the global flood and a ton of other stuff in that magazine, revealing that this, this, is, this Bible is true. Why doesn't the world get it? Well, why don't you read some of the rebuttals that geologists give to these evidences? These rebuttals may not convince you, but if you actually listened to them and considered them, at least you'd know why geologists don't find the idea of a global flood convincing. What's at issue with the book of Genesis and the books of Moses is a world whose heart is hard. You and I have a tendency to want to fix their brains. We see their thinking. It's so preposterous. It's so detached from a reality and they're wrecking everything. And we look at it and we go, our kids and the next generations, and what are we leaving for them? Freedom of religion, freedom of speech, common sense, which died a couple of decades ago. We, 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 we want to fix it, and we think that if we just address the head, their thinking will get better. That is not the way God operates, and I mean that in a surgical kind of way. He fixes the heart. He regenerates the soul then the thinking will improve. I guess that's why so many apologists make so many appeals to emotion. They know that unless they can get you to feel what they want you to feel, they have little chance of convincing you to think what they want you to think. To everyone who helps me out on Patreon, you're a big help. Thanks so much.